Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners, macabre murders from across the centuries, and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 56. It is. Season 2 something. I can't remember. Uh, see, I knew it. I knew you'd forget the numbers of the seasons. You get four, all high and mighty. Four, five, twenty-eight. 28. Don't know. Yeah, 56. I'm just quietly keeping I've lost, up. I've lost good. track. How are you, Nick? Yeah, right. Yeah. Hey, can't complain. Been at work. <laughs> Not been doing much else. Though, next week is <gasps> Can Sit in the Garden. Garden Cans. Legally allowed to sit in the garden. So that's quite exciting. With other people. Not long to go. No, no, yeah, not just by yourself. They're not letting you out into that. You can go into the garden <laughs> for your daily exercise alone. So alone. With more people. So very soon. Yeah, that's quite exciting. Were any poisonings this week? No. No. No, it's so again, it's all very quiet out there. It's very quiet. People have got other things going on. You're just in preparation for the garden cans. Well, you can, you can invite people into your garden. You can Hopefully you'll have planted the lovely seeds that Carla Valentine sent us, which <laughs> yes. are resplendent in their Bella Donnelly goodness. <laughs> I can just give that to everyone. Exactly, yes. You don't need to poison anyone this week because they're yeah, going have to... have a lovely bouquet. <laughs> they're going to die as soon as they step into your house. But also, as we established on Patreon this week, you'll, uh, you'll pee on people if they stay too long. I thought, did we? But I thought, yes, yes, we did. <laughs> yes, you very um, much did say that. <laughs> that was such a long time ago. Well, speaking of peeing on people, uh, I think it's time for us to thank our <laughs> Patreon subscribers because they know what we're talking about. <laughs> That's how we do thank people. Um, so, thank you for to well to Deezer Turner, who's in for a delightful surprise, and to Lacey from Hardly Paranormal, the wonderful podcast. We love you, Lacey. Thank you for joining us. Mm-hmm, very good. Thank uh, you. As per usual, my husband is downstairs playing FIFA online, and just as we were talking about peeing on people, you just heard this noise from downstairs going, "Oh!" No, I didn't hear that, but I take your word for it. No, I did. I did. People on the podcast will hear it. Well, Nick. Mm. Are you ready Mm -hmm. to drink cocktails and talk about poison? Oh, yeah, sure, right, I am. You've promised me a good one, so, yep. Or or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. (laughs) Not today, I think. No, we should go with the first one. Okay, we're racing through this. It's (laughs) great. Rattling through this introduction nonsense. (laughs) Hello, how are you? Get on with it. (laughs) When does the drinking start? It's late. I want to go to bed. Come on. horror of horrors people i started recording this at eight o'clock at night and nick is not best please eight o'clock ludicrous hour for a recording he's already in his smoking jacket and wearing his <laughs> nightcap the hot water <laughs> bottle shall be cold by the time i get upstairs now <laughs> you mean the boy hasn't turned down your bed with the bedpan where they put hot coals into a bed they used to do that in the olden times didn't not, they? In a, not in a bedpan they didn't oh no the well, what's it what was it called bed warming oh, pan. A, a, a warming pan Oh, I'm sorry, that was such a leap away. You could get the two well, confused. Well, uh, no, but a, a bedpan is what you're peeing when you're in hospital. So you don't <laughs> want coals in that. <laughs> well, you don't want to get the two confused. Pee on some coals and then put some urine in your bed. <laughs> so these are, these are not things to get mixed up. No. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you have a supply of both of them in the house. So. <laughs> okay, we're going to go with the first one. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It's my story this week, but we can't, we can't, we can't possibly tell a story without a cocktail in hand. Oh, yes, it's cocktail time. Cocktail time. I have eaten very little this week due to my lovely new healthy eating regime. Uh, so I will be drunk within uh, sips of this, whatever we do. Well, that sounds great fun. It is. As you know, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and will flavour our cocktail of the week. My story, so my pick. And this week's secret ingredient, Nick, is... Is... Fat. Lovely. Lovely. Everyone likes a bit of fat. Lovely fat. I'm so (laughs) sorry to everyone who... It was the a delightful picture. picture you put up there. That was like, Ugh. You'll understand why. But yes, I couldn't just put jars of stuff up and people were going, is that silly string? Or they were like, oh, no, no. What are you doing, woman? Uh, yes, fat, fat, good fats, bad fats, whatever. We'll have all of them. But uh, yes, we don't often have a lot of fat in our drinks, do we? This, this, is, this is true. We don't often. But so I thought we were, it's time for a change, I thought. It's, it's not a common ingredient in drinks, but I don't know. I trust you, Nick. I well, trust you. Well, it might be more common. Oh, ooh. well, with fat as the ingredient, mm-hmm. what have you come up with? We have referenced this in a previous episode when we did bacon as a secret ingredient. Bacon. And we did our candied bacon. So, and we did what mentioned this. So 
we have well we have i have we have i have it has been made <laughs> it has been done it has been done um more see this is the season of experimentation and chemistry <laughs> It is truly the poisoner's cabinet. So we have a stash now of fat washed bourbon. Oh my god! Fat washed bourbon. Yes, we did talk about that before. Which is, um, I'm very intrigued and also, what about it? Yeah, so I've never had this. It has a big reputation mm. of being quite delicious and lovely and people do it a lot. Uh, or it's available in, in cocktail bars and things a lot. I think it's regularly done at home. Um, and it's always something I wanted to try. I've never done it, never tried a cocktail with it. So this is the homemade version. So again, we've given you just a corker of an ingredient that you can just go to your cupboard people and pull yeah. out. But we'll talk through the, um, well, the, the method by which you create fat washed bourbon. But what are we going to make cocktail wise? Well, we're going to keep it simple because I'm very intrigued to see how this actually tastes. So we're going to keep it very simple. We're going to go with an old fashioned. Yay! An old fashioned. Simple, not too much else in there, so we really see what's going on. That's what we're going to do today. I'm excited. So, as ever, Nick has delivered me a selection of the ingredients. Obviously, he had to fat wash some bourbon, but (laughs) it's time for us to go and construct a couple of options this week that we can work our way through. So, time for us to go into our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. So, we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Oh, exciting week. Exciting times. A classic cocktail, but with a twist. With a twist. With a Mm -hmm. twist, indeed. Now, I've not been into old fashions uh, before. Only very recently getting into it, getting into the bourbon. But I'm very excited for this because of the old uh, old fat-washed bourbon. Well, indeed. Going to talk us through it first, or are we going to taste it? Well, let's, let's taste it, and then we'll reveal the the horrible methods of its <laughs> manufacture afterwards so i mean we have actually made two old fashions i've made one with the fat washed bourbon mm-hmm. and then one with exactly the same bourbon but not fat washed yeah fat free almost we're gonna do a fat <laughs> fat free bourbon so we're going to do a, a contrast and compare experimentation to see Does it actually make that much of a difference? Which I'm intrigued to find out. We'll go through the ingredients in a moment, but we're going to dive in and taste this classic bourbon cocktail, starting with the fat-washed bourbon. Ooh, shaky, shaky, shaky. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Bit of a a swizzle. Do I see it? I don't know. Okay. Uh, 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 What do you see? uh, I'll tell you in a minute. (laughs) Let's taste it first. Okay, cheers. Cheers. It's very pleasant. Mm. Bourbony. Bourbony. Bold. (laughs) <laughs> yeah okay so that's that's one version yeah it's very nice old-fashioned my mum was a bit stronger than i thought <laughs> <laughs> so now i'm going to try the the non fat okay, one okay i'm going to do the same too if it takes any difference <laughs> okay let's do it again all right, all right cheers merry christmas Ooh, you can oh you definitely can I didn't think you were going to. I thought it was me one going, I don't know which one's which, but you actually can taste the difference. And I do prefer the fat wash one. That's really weird. It's not what you would think, <laughs> though, people. It's not what you would think. Okay, Nick, I think you need to talk us through it so everyone understands what the hell is going on in here. Right. So basically, fat washing, you can do it with pretty much any fat, really. I've done it with bacon fat. Because you're a god, that's why. Because it's, well, bourbon and bacon is a classic combination oh, yeah. especially in the mornings <laughs> cooked up a load of bacon at the bacon um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a hard day for you wasn't it was it, it was a dreadful dreadful <laughs> I, mean, I have to eat a whole packet of bacon for the podcast you're like pinchy the lobster in the simpsons <laughs> <laughs> once you've consumed the bacon you should be left with a big old pan full of bacon fat <laughs> <laughs> nice which basically basically you just pour into yeah, bourbon. I made it with half a bottle of bourbon I used. Oh. So about 300 and... What? 375 mils? Yeah. Ish. Just say half a bottle. Um, half a bo- People understand what a bottle is. <laughs> half, a bo- half a bottle of bourbon um, and I poured bacon fat into it and it went all fizzly spitty Ooh. for a bit. Sealed up the bottle, gave it a shake and left it overnight. Left it. To do its thing. The flavours are supposed to what infuse with Yes, the... so it sort of infuses over <laughs> overnight. When you read about it, there are stories of it taking on quite a bacony <laughs> characteristic. It depends what bacon you used. <laughs> this hasn't, uh-huh. I don't think, done <laughs> okay. that. No, I don't think so either. I, I'm not getting a I'm not getting a bacony flavour. But what it does 
it's quite interesting is that sort of the fat molecules in it sort of soften the edges yeah. of the the bourbon and make it a lot smoother and almost slightly silkier as well to to drink so obviously once you've left it to infuse overnight or whatever you then strain out the big lumps of fat and bits of bacon and stuff like that so you're not getting that in your glass you strain it through muslin (laughs) yeah we're not just drinking bourbon through a big layer of fat (laughs) much as we'd love to you you get rid of all that strain it out a couple of times until you're left with a clear non-bitty bourbon i was worried a minute ago that my bourbon with the ice in it had got a bit of solidified fat suddenly because no. of the ice but it wasn't it was just a bit of ice and it I has panicked. been strained about three times three <laughs> or four times so there's no way there's any fat or bits of bacon or anything left in this and i am amazed how much of a difference that has actually made it really does i'm just i'm double tasting again again i've got two drinks i'm just i've just been sitting here for the last <laughs> three minutes holding two drinks going whoa yeah i'm really surprised by that yeah you would expect with a bacon fat washed drink you'd be getting a big hit of bacon but the fat wash version just yeah it definitely tastes silkier it just yeah just smooths it all down and things it's still quite strong if you're not oh, naturally yeah, I mean, a, still... a whiskey drinker a bourbon drinker this is not going to take away that that delightful whiskey kick but it's just going to round the edges as you yeah. said yeah 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 no that's i mean for those i'm sure okay uh, an old-fashioned go through that mm. is basically again there are loads of different versions the one i've done is a sugar cube so i've chosen uh, demerara brown sugar cube in the bottom of your old-fashioned glass a tumbler douse that with a few dashes of bitters i've used angostura's you can get sort of like proper or specifically designed old-fashioned mm. bitters and stuff like that i've used angostura and i left it for a couple of minutes to sort of dissolve a bit and then gave it a good old smash with the uh, your muddler the back of a spoon or something put my ice cube in gave it a bit of a a swirl just with the ice cube to get the ice to dilute a little bit and then one and a half ounces of bourbon in the glass delicious and that's it so it is the one of the most uncomplicated cocktails you're going to make yeah and it the fat wash bourbon makes such a difference i am really surprised by that i am too Uh, my my personal favorite recipe for a an old fashioned. There are, as we said, many versions out there. Um, I think it's one that Diffords shared. Again, it's using bourbon, but in the bottom of the glass, you use the Angostura bitters. You take a slice of orange, because often mm. the old fashions are garnished with orange. Um, slice the orange, put it in the bottom, a little squirt of maple syrup, or you can use Demerara sugar, or you could use another kind of syrup. I've even used agave syrup if I've had that in the cupboard. But with the orange and the bitters and your sugar, mash that up and literally you mash the fruit in there. Um, It's a thin slice of orange, then the ice, as you said, then the bourbon on top, a little swizzle around, and that is a goddamn delight. That is really, Mm -hmm. really nice. If you, because again, if you want to take the harsh edge of the whiskey off, and you want to have something fruity and sweet and delightful and aromatic, that is a lovely, lovely version of, a, of an old-fashioned if you want to try something a little bit different. But we have, woo, have we have a newcomer to the ring. Yeah. I love it. All of you can make an old-fashioned on Friday night. Don't panic. Don't come at us about all our experimenting. <laughs> you have time to make a few old-fashions by the time this episode comes out and to start infusing your bourbon and you get to make a load of bacon yeah i mean what's not to love really what's not to love what kind of bacon did you use um i use bacon i got from the supermarket it was like back bacon streaky bacon uh, it was back bacon smoked bacon it was smoked bacon nice nice but it wasn't the fanciest of bacons but it was just it what because i didn't go to the fancy pig shop i went where i passed on my way home why have i never heard of the fancy pig shop because <laughs> that sounds amazing that sounds like a great place to hang out and get fancy pig meat also served by a fancy pig in a top hat <laughs> that i would hope <laughs> quite right yay so now we have two old fashions so basically we've got two lots of bourbon in front of I've us i've got two old fashions and a gin and, ton- gin and tonic and it's, going well. it's going well it's going well well, thankfully, Nick, it's not your story this week. Hurrah for that. <laughs> but you have played a blinder with another experimental cocktail. <laughs> Living for the experimental cocktails these days, guys. Yeah, so, we like yeah, it. if this Nick is on a roll, so any more experimenting that you'd like him to do, cocktail based or, or not, you know, that's the different tier on <laughs> Patreon. Um, get in touch and let us know what you'd like us to, to, to rustle up in the poisonous cabinet kitchen. But with our old fashions firmly in hand, fat washed to perfection. Are you ready for a story, Nick? Yes. Yes, I think so. And it's a good one this week. Slightly concerned about where the fat comes into it. Oh, you should be. You should be. (laughs) This is an exceptional tale. And we are going 
to Spain. We've we've not been to Spain, have we? We ha- I don't think we have on the main no. episode. We we've danced there, danced there once and on Patreon. Well, we yeah, b- brief brief excursion. Someone on a boat went to Spain once, um, but that's about it. <laughs> that was the crux of all of Nick's story. Yeah. <laughs> Someone on a boat went to Spain and they died. It was a great day. No, we are properly going to Spain. Gather round, children, for I'm going to tell you the chilling tale of Manuel. Blanco, Roma Santa. Oh, excellent accent there. Excellent, it? excellent name and excellent accent work going on there. Oh yes, yes. Now, brace yourself. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> oh no, it's 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 good. Brace yourself. Okay. Not bad. Brace yourself. Where you go? Oh, this isn't going to be fun. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> now, let us start with Manuel. He was born in 1809 in the. Orens province, I hope I'm saying that right, in Spain. Write in, come at me for the pronunciation. (laughs) Record messages of you saying the names of the places that I'm saying wrong, because I like it, it's soothing. But yes, Manuel was born in 1809, and, well, quite a bit is known about his childhood. Is it? My God, that makes, makes a change. Yes, it's, it's, it's quite pivotal to his life, I, I oh, would God. say. Uh, Manuel <laughs> did not have a great start in life. Yes, his birth, his birth was difficult, difficult on the mother. It was a, it was a tricky birth. And when he emerged, <laughs> written that without really thinking that through, haven't I? <laughs> emerged from down there. He was declared an unknown critter by the doctors. Nice, nice. Mm. That's good to have in your birth certificate. Yes, he had what could only be assumed birth defects that made it impossible to tell if he was a boy or a girl. Mm -hmm. Mm. So whether he was intersex, whether he had other physical deformities they'd not encountered, we don't know. Some say he was the youngest child of five. Others say he was the seventh son of a seventh son. No, he wasn't. I really don't think he was. I think the five kids, that's it. I read one report and they said he's a seventh son. I was like, no, he wasn't. (laughs) No, I didn't wasn't. know him, and even I know that. <laughs> no, no, no. He was as young as a five. As I said, did not know if he was a boy or a girl. But the family went with girl. Okay. And he was first named Manuela. Nice. Okay. He was dressed as a girl, educated and treated as one right up until the age of six. Okay. When the doctors or someone finally noticed he was, in fact, a boy. Right. Okay. <laughs> and and that's got to be pretty tough. Yeah. This this Ambiguity. question mark over his <laughs> gender. It wasn't worked out until the age of six. Bloody hell. And by that time, Manuela had obviously been raised as a girl. He didn't know any different. He had been treated a certain way all of his life, but suddenly was told he had to change. You have to transform into a man now. No more dresses and dolls for you. You have to act and speak like a boy. You have to go out bullfighting now. Exactly. Take, take this cape and out you go. <laughs> Bring me back a bull. I don't think that's how it works. Well, we don't know. We never raised a boy. But they didn't actually change his name to Manuel until he was eight. Right. So he had a girl's name, but was expected to behave. <laughs> and be like a boy all they had to do was remove the a yeah it's not a complex task i know it was convenient they called him manuela well that's true if they'd called him bruce then mm. <laughs> as so many spanish families do <laughs> no petunia actually is a boy then petunia petunia Those classic Petunio. spanish names so it's not a brilliant start to life for him confusing, confusing confusing start. i should say but manuel as he was now known was was very bright as a child he learned to read and write quite young which we can probably assume that means he came from a wealthy family. Yes. Also, his chances for an education would have improved when they realised he was a boy. Pump all the money into that. Great, excellent, we've got a boy. Not that it made much of a difference. He went on to have further trouble in his teens because after having to suddenly become a boy after being raised a girl, into his teens he stopped growing. Mm. He was very, very short in his teenage years and he would never grow beyond. People differ between four foot 11 at the most and four foot six at the smallest. So it's no great. That is quite wee. It is, it is. He's also blonde and tender looking. He still went on to forge a good, honest living as a tailor. Some people called him a dressmaker, probably because they were being a bit unfair. This persistent idea that because of the way he was raised as a baby, he must be effeminate in his youth and his adulthood. But maybe that was nasty rumours. There are reports that Manuel got married in his late teens. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. But the happiness was short-lived, for his wife died suddenly when he was 24. Oh. 
boo, uh, nothing seemingly untoward about this, but it was enough to change the course of Manuel's life. He was settled as a tailor, but he decides that he's going to go and become a traveling salesman. What he was selling at the time isn't exactly clear when he started out on this path, but maybe he just went, I'm going to be a traveling salesman and walked out yep. the door and everyone went, okay. Okay, off you go. You'll sell, sell your story. <laughs> but what we do know is that as well as this sales business he had on his side, he also acted as a guide for people traveling through the mountains of northern Spain across various regions. You've got to think we're in the 1800s. Not a lot of easy maps through the area. No, nope, indeed, absolutely. There's no Google Maps there. Nope. There's no uh, tour guys driving around four by fours. You would need a guide. You would need someone to yeah, show you the path cool. through the mountains. And this is also a period of time where there's a lot of issues in northern Spain. There was actually a massive famine uh, that would, would, would set in later in his life, which was causing a lot of people to migrate and to, to move around the area to, to look for food, essentially. So, yeah, it's a lucrative business. So off he went mm. and spent around the next decade selling his wares and guiding people over the rocky paths of the Spanish mountains with the knapsack on his back. <laughs> da, da. He didn't. I don't know. There's no reports of knapsacks. Da, but I'd like to picture it. I know. Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? But, 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 but. But. In 1844, Manuel's simple life had turned rather complicated. Mm. A constable named Vincente Fernandez came looking for him. There's some excellent names all the way through good. this, by the I way. Like a good name. They came looking for Manuel to collect a debt of 600 real, I think that was the currency mm -hmm. at the time, that he owed to a supplier for some of the goods he was flogging. He owed this debt and the constable comes a knocking. Manuel did not pay the debt. <sighs> and Vincente forgot all about it. Forgot all about it on account of the fact that he was dead. <laughs> dead. It does make one forgetful. I find it does. Yes, around this time in Manuel's life, the constable's dead body was discovered after he had gone searching for Manuel and Manuel himself had fled the region. Now, the details of this death are scant and few and far between, but it was pretty obvious to the authorities that this was unnatural causes and Manuel was to blame mm. however this man died. And a trial was held. Manuel was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 10 years that is. in jail. 10 years for murder? That doesn't seem a lot. No, it's not a lot. Especially if you're not there. Oh, right. Okay. He's not even there at the time. Brilliant. Yeah, it was all held in absentia because Manuel had fled. He had fled the region. So they held <laughs> him. Because he's in the mountains somewhere. <laughs> yeah. He'd run away. But the judge was, no, we shall try him in absentia. And held a huge trial. <laughs> and then he had 10 years. He's not here. No one will suffer for this. <laughs> There's a reason for holding a trial in absentia because it would mean that Manuel was now on the run, essentially, mm, in Spain. If he was ever found, yes, he's a fugitive, a fugitive. And he does very fugitive things. He takes refuge in abandoned shelters in the countryside. Nice. Yes, this small dwarfish man creeping about trying to conceal his identity. But he isn't caught and he travels around for years in secret, desperate to avoid capture. And so he will take menial jobs wherever he could in the mountain villages around this region of Spain. And when he was in the villages, he would befriend local women and offer to help them with their dressmaking, as he was trained, their laundry. He could make yarn. He could clean their houses. He could do their local crafts or cook for them. They're generally quite feminine-related professions at Indeed. the time. Indeed. Any self-respecting man would have turned their nose up at such tasks. But Manuel, who was described by people as being too gentle and effeminate, and was given some names in Spanish that I won't repeat, mm. seemed to gravitate these simple chores for the ladies and found himself a nice, simple business in each of these villages. No one would ever ask questions of him. He was a small, unassuming man who would just help out around. And for this reason, he was very much trusted by the women and the children of the villages he visited and of the villages he lived in for times. He once again decided to return to working as a mountain guide for travellers. He was a trustworthy, simple man. He knew the mountain regions well, so he could guide them through or direct them on their travels safely. So off, off these women and children would go on their journeys across the mountains with Manuel as their faithful guide. And no one 
worried about them at all. No, no, why would you? Such a trustworthy chap, he sounds like. Absolutely. And no one had to worry because letters would arrive home, telling their loved ones that they had arrived at their destination safely, or simply they were having a lovely time on the mountain trails. <laughs> it's wonderful mountain trails, beautiful scenery. Beautiful, it's lovely. Beautiful, picture the colours, children. But as the weeks wore on, it became clear that none of these people had actually reached their final destination. No. And certainly none would be returning home. <laughs> Yet the disappearances were not noticed for several weeks. I suppose, you, yeah, I mean, these trips take a long time, so you're not going to notice for some for a while if someone's not come back. Mm. And we're not in the time of reliable communications. Yes, you can't pick up the phone and go, you're there. Um. <laughs> Hopefully with someone at the other end. You don't just pick up, that's not how phones work, you know that. You don't pick up a phone, hey, are you there? Hello? That's how you make friends. <laughs> Hello, operator. <laughs> no one has to question anything. You know, there were there were some worries that Manuel had been spotted in the villages close to his home or in his home village, trying to sell clothing and possessions that didn't seem like they belonged to him. Mm. But, you know, no one was really sure where these items had come from. If he had acquired them, he was a travelling salesman. He did menial jobs around. Perhaps people had gifted him. Yep. Certain things that they didn't need that he could sell. And also Manuel didn't really need the money. I mean, he was a guide as a hobby and that brought him in some coins. He was also doing very well for himself as he'd found a good trade selling wonderful locally made soap. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice soaps. Oh, I think... Oh, do we know what this, the way this is going? There was a lot of lavender around. It was there. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> so as we said, without reliable communications in these mountain villages and the fact that it's the 18 goddamn hundreds, there was still the <laughs> faint hope that these people might turn up, either at their destination or return home. But as the mm-hmm. days wore on, search parties were sent out onto the mountain trails to find traces of their loved ones who had gone astray. Was Manuel leading these search parties? <laughs> he was just he was pointing out the scenery as he went. This is yeah. the best pine tree ever. We have walked for five minutes. Please let us carry on. You're awful. Stop selling us soap. And also, what does that say about our village that you're selling soap? You're the only guy selling soap. <laughs> we don't smell. But as the search parties went on and they went into the mountainous regions and they followed the trails... What they did find would turn their stomachs, because they did indeed find some of the women who had vanished. And they found their bodies mutilated to almost beyond recognition, as if they had been savaged by some terrible beast. Terrible beastie, terrible Spanish beastie in the mountains. (laughs) It's a beastie, run! It's a beastie! You can imagine the panic and the fear that is struck into the hearts of the villagers. Well, beasties will do that. Beasties will do that. (laughs) You know, were the travellers who wandered off into the mountains prey to some hideous creature up there, a bear, a wolf, or something worse, torn to shreds, (laughs) or carried off whole and eaten in some grim lair so they can't find traces of them? My God, our women and children! Or, or was the true horror closer to home? Mm. In 1852, after all these investigations, a complaint was finally made to the police in the city of Escolana that Manuel had been tricking women by posing as a well-meaning guide and then had done away with them in order to sell their goods for himself. What is worse is that the goods that Manuel was alleged to have stolen was the very fat from their bodies. Oh, I knew that was coming. (laughs) That's really grim. All so he could make his beautiful, beautiful soaps and sell them to local villagers. Oh, bleh. That's why one of his early nicknames was the Tallow Man. (laughs) That's That's a good name to have, though. If you need a scary nickname, the Tallow Man is a good one. The thing is, is that having the Tallow Man as your nickname is fantastic. He was lucky enough to have two nicknames. Oh. And the second one is even better, in oh, my it? opinion. I oh, like the Tallow Man. Now. It's mysterious. It's yeah. uh, the Tallow Man. But stay with me, Nick. Okay, okay. Manuel was arrested in September 1852, and he was brought to trial for the murder of 13 people. Wow. People aged between 10 and 47. Mm. So, yeah, women and children here. Yeah. Now, perhaps Manuel's lawyers could have argued that there was no clear evidence to link Manuel to these people's disappearances, aside from all the soap. <laughs> aside from the, those big stashes of soap. 
Yes. I've got lovely names like, was it Petunia and <laughs> Daisy? <laughs> that soap, that could be anyone's ass. <laughs> well, aside from all the soaps, the bodies were found so torn apart that there was little way anyone could prove that a man was responsible for it. Maybe the lawyers could have reasoned that if Manuel had not confessed. Oh, oh, well, that's unexpected. And he used a defence that would knock the court and the world for six. The villagers were very smelly. <laughs> they smelled, they smelled so, so bad. bad. They needed soap. This was the only possible way to get soap. <laughs> I would have, yeah, that would have been ballsy. <laughs> I would have liked it. You'd be like, damn, that man's sassy. Th- yeah. He's awful. No. No. No, it's, okay. it's a nice guess. It's a nice guess. Manuel admitted that he had indeed killed all of these people, but it wasn't his fault. The beasties. The beasties. He hadn't meant to because he was cursed. Right. Cursed to turn into a wolf. Was he? Right. (laughs) This is the first and only time in Spanish history that lycanthropy... So that werewolfism has been used as a defence. ...would be used. Absolutely. (laughs) Yes, it is. He was a werewolf. Of course he was. People! Of course he was. I shall read you Manuel's own testimony from the trial. And I won't do it in a Spanish accent because I don't want to be sued. Or... <laughs> By Spain. I trust. If I tried to do a Spanish accent, all of Spain would sue me. Okay. <laughs> I love the fucking brass balls on this man that no one could see, apparently, when he was born. The first time I transformed was in the mountains of Coso. I came across two ferocious-looking wolves. I suddenly fell to the ground and began to feel convulsions. I rolled over three times, and a few seconds later, I was a wolf. I was out marauding with the other two for five days. Until I returned to my own body, the one you see before you today, Your Honour. The other two wolves came with me, who I also thought were also wolves changed into human form. They were from Valencia. (laughs) But had desperately English accents. (laughs) One was called Antonio, and the other Don Gennaro. They too were cursed, and we attacked and ate a number of people because we were hungry. <laughs> okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. just a side note in there. I love the fact that he built this story while giving a testimony in court and gave those wolves backstories. Well, absolutely. I mean, these committed. Antonio oh, that, and Don that. Gennaro. Oh, there were men from Valencia, also cursed. Are you cursed like me? Oh, let us go wandering through the mountains together. What luck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the frenzied attacks on these poor women and children were carried out by a man who claimed to have been transformed into a wolf. He said he used his hands and teeth to kill them and then ate their remains. Because he was a wolf. Obviously. And how convenient that all of the fat was left exposed for him to use. I mean, that, I mean that's, that's a leap. <laughs> I, I've transformed, I'm a werewolf. I've transformed into a wolf. I have viciously been out and killed these villagers, these women, because I'm hungry, because I'm a wolf. I have then... <laughs> You're with him at this point, aren't you? You're I've with then, him. <laughs> I've then turned back into a human person and thought, ooh, I know, I need some soap. Waste not, want not. See, it's that last bit. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So that's the, it's the, it's the last bit that he's, he's not convinced me on, I have mm. to say. Well, you, you would be in the same mood as the rest of the court at this point, Nick. Um, <laughs> prosecutor. I'm going to cast you in the role of prosecutor. Okay. A miss, uh, who has an excellent name, if I, if I do this justice. Luciano. Bastida Hernanes. Nice. Yes. And I can see you as him leaning against the desk, drumming his fingers, going, okay. <laughs> well, gonna need you to prove this. Yeah. I want mm-hmm. a demonstration now. Absolutely. That's what they called for. They said, transform for the court, wolf man. We yep. want to see your wolfy goodness. Ah, oh, Manuel replied, uh, you see, the curse only lasts for 13 years. And that time period had literally just expired the week before. <laughs> oh, how desperately convenient. Um. Oh, it's great that he has the big book of werewolves to well, yeah, call upon. Like, oh, these are the rules that we follow. These are the okay. rules of the werewolves. The, the curse only lasts 13 <laughs> years. Not heard that one before. The oh. goddamn drama of it as well. 13 years I was afflicted, but it just ended, so I'm all right now. 
13 years last Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, if you'd only caught me earlier. Yeah. Oh, dude, I so want to change into a werewolf for you. <laughs> yeah, so Manuel, he crazy. <laughs> Well, is he crazy? Is he crazy? It's incredible. It's incredible that he believes this. And so many doctors are drafted in. Doctors, come, yep, please. Why? What the hell is going on here? <laughs> and the doctors, personally, I love this bit. The doctor's like, yes, we shall prove whether he is sane or whether he is insane. And they use a lot of phrenology to guide their I mean, diagnosis. That, that, I mean, that, that's going to that's help, isn't it? <laughs> You've got wolfy lumps going on, so... I know. He's he's a crazy wolf man. I shall prove it by touching his head a lot. Ah, he has the <laughs> evil lump. He's got the lump here. He must be a wolf. <laughs> I love phrenology. I do really... I, I mean, it's great. I want one of those, um, the busts of phrenology. Oh, the heads. You know, yeah, the yeah. heads where it just says, this bit is evil, this bit is for snacks. I don't think it says that, but um, I find it fascinating. There's some great books written about it. But yes, just in a trial where a guy is shouting, I'm a wolf, the phrenologists are the least crazy people in there. Like, yeah, bring it on, man. This is now the time to bring up phrenology because you're not going to sound more crazy We're not, yeah. <laughs> We're not the craziest in the room, so yeah. <laughs> Fill your boots. This is what we've been waiting for. In this case, again, inspires more people later. I shall come on to this. But yes, they, they do all the touchy, touchy head, touchy head business. Many of them as well. The doctors thankfully reached the conclusion that he has made the whole thing up. Lies. Lies. Don't think you need to touch his head for that. <laughs> but there's an interesting twist here. According to the court records, he was acquitted of four of the murders he had confessed to because forensic evidence found that those victims had actually died in real wolf attacks. Oh. But he was found guilty for the other nine because they found evidence that he had butchered them. Yeah, there you go. The victims, Manuela Garcia, age 47, and her daughter Petra, who was 15, Benita Garcia Balanco, 34, and her son Francisco, who was 10, Antonia Land was 37 years old, and, the, and her daughter Peregrina died. Josefa Garcia and her son Jose Pazos, who was 21, died. And Maria Dolores, who was 12. Yeah. So he, he, he is shit. Yes. yes. Yeah. Those are the people he was convicted of murdering. Medical experts claim his actions were entirely voluntary, yet they could not find a reason for why he did all of this. Perhaps it was just a far-fetched scheme to cover up his horrific soap-making business. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what I really don't get about this, is the soap making. The soap making is taken as fact in a lot of the reports on this one. However, there may be, an, it may have translated into, yes, he definitely took the fat to make soap, or it was a nasty rumour at the time right. that got embellished, embellished, embellished over the, over the years. We could say that about any of the cases that we cover. Maybe there were little bits no, of it yeah, where well, people say, yeah. I mean, people have said, no, it turned out to be true that he did. He was making soap with people's fat. And it, given his in level of insanity, it's entirely likely. The doctors ruled, the medical experts said he was not stupid. They said, and I quote, he instead turns out to be a pervert, an accomplished criminal capable of anything, cool and collected and without goodness, but acts with free will, freedom and knowledge. Oh. So Manuel is ultimately sentenced to death by garroting. Oh, that's a nice way to go. You know how they yeah, do. You yeah. know how they do the garroting. Is it with like a twisty thing around a rope and a twisty thing? Yeah, in the chair. Yeah. Twisty, 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 bit twisty. Bit. Rope around the neck and it gets tighter and tighter. Yeah. Yeah. It's it is some, there's some horrific Until pictures out there off. of it, but yeah, yeah, not 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 so good. There was a lengthy ratification process with the sentence. I think it was just part of the legal system at the time where he was, it, it was, should he have a life sentence? But then there was an appeal by the prosecution. I know original death sentence reinstated. The trial was sensational for obvious reasons. Well, yeah, that, that it would be, I imagine, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of trials that we cover where it's like, oh, they killed someone. Oh my God. This was, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, that's mad. In a trial, I don't think there was a case in a trial before this where lycanthropy was used as a defence. Certainly there have been rumours and obviously all sorts of folklore about lycanthropy beforehand and a apparent real life cases. But to have it as a defence... Mm. As a legal thing, as a, yeah, as an interesting choice. Interesting, interesting. And Manuel would be known as the tallow man, but also the werewolf 
of Alaritz. So I prefer the tallow man. <laughs> I like the tallow man, but also he a werewolf. Good. He a goddamn werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> the tallow man's more mysterious. More, more kind Tallow's of... is more threatening. It's, it's more it's subtler <laughs> and more creepy. Whereas werewolf is like, oh, it's a werewolf. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, the tallow, tallow man, man is like what the fuck it's like the slender man I mean is he a good yes. slender man or is he an evil slender man you don't know <laughs> no one was thinking the slender man was good <laughs> well how do you know if it is, so oh, no. could have been, it could have been the slender man as a kid's book yeah there we are. <laughs> so, the tallow yeah. man could be you can picture that totally as the cover of what a Joe Nesbo novel or something mm. or some sort of Nordic noir absolutely yeah the tallow man yeah yeah. yeah, indeed. Where is the werewolf of Valoritz? Oh, well, he's just a werewolf. <laughs> he's just a werewolf. <laughs> well, excuse me for liking the fact that the guy went balls out on the werewolf defence. <laughs> I mean, good for him. I mean, he's he had a story and he's stuck with it. So. He's stuck with it. But Manuel would not end up in the chair, slowly being strangled to death by the state. No, 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 no. A hypnotist known as Mr. Phillips... Mr. Phillips. <laughs> so again, a good, dramatic, subtle sort of name. <laughs> yes. I like it. He was from Mysterious. England. He was in England at the time. Yeah. This is true. You, this you is you true. Just imagine him has a really sort of tall, <laughs> gaunt man with a top hat. Mr. Phillips comes in. <laughs> and then, then he's, he sort of glides in without moving his legs. You know? <laughs> well, he's like the gentleman from Buffy. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, that's what exactly is. Mr. Phillips. Mr. And Phillips. <laughs> He's got has... a pocket watch as he as he glides in. His pocket watch is swinging. <laughs> I'll say this in a sinister voice. The rest of it. <laughs> Mister Phillips has been following the case most closely, nice. and he wrote an appeal to the Ministry of Justice in Spain and said that Manuel was indeed suffering from a psychological condition known as lycanthropy, a condition that he had studied and he had treated well with success, and it meant he was not in control of his actions. Give him to Mr. Phillips to study. <laughs> <laughs> We laugh. His pleas resulted in Queen Isabella II herself commuting the death sentence to life so that Manuel could be studied by experts. By, mis- by Mr. Phillips. <laughs> by Mr. Phillips. I'll come nice. back to Mr. Phillips in a minute and I will read I'm... something from that okay. uh, because it's, it's weird. But <laughs> Manuel would not be garroted. He would spend his life in prison. Also, they'd hoped. It doesn't seem that Manuel ever benefited from any serious medical study or hypnotic help. Shortly after arriving in prison, Manuel is said to have died. A lot of people say it was from illness, and there was one newspaper report a few years later that said, in prison, the unfortunately famous Manuel Blanco Romesanta, known in all Spain as the werewolf, as a consequence of his atrocities and his misdeeds, and who was sentenced to prison by the court in La Corana, died in that place on the 14th of this month being the victim of stomach cancer very long-winded way of saying he did yeah yeah (laughs) but there were others who said that manuel really died after he was shot by a guard who wanted to see him transform into the wolf he said he was but he, uh, it was th- it was over thirteen years ago. It's he not going to happen. To tell him, yes. Oh, but there are God. even others who say Manuel escaped from prison and returned to the mountains of Spain, and there the werewolf roams still uh, today. Now we need a howl. Now can we have, can we get a howl? <laughs> <laughs> and again, I don't think I'll title this as the werewolf. I might say the tallow man or something because I don't want to give away the lycanthropy bit because I love that. <laughs> but that is the story of Manuel Blanco Romes Santa. I mean, that's a good. I had not heard that story, and that's a very <laughs> good story. That's a good, good story. I mean, it's one of those ones you read and just go, just throw every other bit of research out the window. This yeah. is what we're doing this week. Yeah, absolutely. You can see why I pushed for fat as the secret ingredient so yeah, heartily. No, Absolutely. Yep. No, entirely accepted and wise to do so. <laughs> yeah. What I do want to do for this one, this one has piqued my interest. Okay. So people may remember back back in season one, quite early on, we had a friend of ours, Rowana, on, who is a clinical psychologist. She is. And she knows many clever things. So I would be very intrigued to hear about the psychology of someone actually believing that they are a werewolf or in fact we have people who believe they are vampires and that sort of thing oh yeah so not just making up a story that they know is rubbish to try mm-hmm. and get off but actually believing 
that that is true that yeah. they are that they can turn into a wolf or whatever it's how such a good idea let's get Ro how on. people have what happens to people to make them believe such a uh, an out there thing well it's a genuine it's a genuine condition like yeah, anthropy absolutely. is a general it's called i think it's called clinical lycanthropy yeah but there have been cases again you can you can delve into this massive you can go down a google hole black hole looking into this but there have been lots of cases of people writing about where people believe they've turned into animals and mm. they either use it as a blackout method. So they go, I've woken up and I don't know what I've done, but I yep. think an animal took over my thoughts or they hallucinate seeing certain things and they think the devil has taken over them in animal form. Uh, I mean, that's a very, very roundabout way of saying it. But yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, let's get Ro to so, talk about that. I yeah. don't know if it's it. I don't know if she's dealt with many werewolves. But well, she so knows they, more than us. <laughs> she knows you well, exactly. Yep, she'll be able to extrapolate something from that better than we can, I'm quite sure. Indeed. Um, so I will give you the background on... Would you like the background on Mr. Phillips? Oh, yes, Mr. Phillips, the, the crazy hypnotist. It, yes, it's, I want to know. It's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. There's not... You'll kind of go like... Oh, you, we sort of wish that Mr. Phillips was, I don't know, Charles Dickens or something like that. <laughs> but a couple of random sources in this one, but it's the simplest way of describing it. There's no evidence about the identity of Mr. Phillips but it was believed that he was the French physician Jean-Pierre Durand de Grosse who had been exiled to Britain who later returned to France using the pseudonym Dr Phillips. Ah. It was said that he later influenced well his works later influenced Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. So Mm -hmm. and the Wolfman trial someone has written in saying it began at the golden age of hypnotism now that's a citation that is needed very much in in wikipedia however if you know your psychology if you know your psychotherapy behind it it is actually at the right sort of time where it is yeah where people are starting to use hypnotism really as clinical treatment yes there's a lot of mysticism around it yes there's a lot of people kind of going ah i can cure you i can cure you spiritualism but at the same time a lot of really really strong psych you know mm. psychotherapy that's emerging that's using hypnotism which is maybe mm, a little bit a bit shady now but certainly back then it was like look into my eyes look into my eyes look into my eyes you're a werewolf <laughs> okay fair enough perhaps it was the whole thing was just a circus trick that went wrong <laughs> it could have been <laughs> again that's that's a citation i thought it was worth reading out i'm like uh-huh. hmm, who was mr phillips who was mr phillips i'm intrigued by mr phillips because queen isabella the second did receive that letter and mm. she reprieved him from a death sentence and said he needs to it be must studied. must have someone of some reputation or some, some standing for them to go, okay, fine, let's trust this man. Mm. Um, or at least to say... written to us. Yeah, this guy is not... I mean, of all of the medical evidence, I think, in this trial... Ev- <laughs> again, medical evidence of the phrenologist. Yeah. <laughs> <in there. laughs> I mean, it's a crazy trial, but what seems to have been extracted from it is that this man said he was a werewolf. He believed he was a werewolf. They didn't prove that conclusively you're lying and you murdered people just for the sake of it there was enough doubt that was caused there going do we need to actually examine this guy is he just crazy and did he have an episode of psychosis which we know has happened in other cases where people have just suddenly attacked and torn someone apart thinking they were a wolf or a bear or whatever else and i i was interested by the fact that four people had actually died from wolf attacks. Yeah, that's a that's a curious. So, I mean, was what that? What do you think about that? Well, I don't know. I mean, it seems was that the reason why? Perhaps he discovered those people. Perhaps, mm. well, perhaps that hit was did happen by wolf, and he was there. And then they did twig. Oh, I can I can get away with this by claiming it's a a wolf or something because that's what happens with wolves. So that was that. Yeah. Some sort of trigger behind him acting that way. I thought um, that too, is that if he saw kind of the savagery, he yes. could just blame a load of murders on wolf yeah. attacks. If, if I'm that bad that and that brutal, then it can be explained away um, by, by wolf. I went down that route myself thinking, okay, well, has he been an opportunist? I'll kill these other people, make it look like wolves, yeah. get the fat, soap business, da-da-da-da-da, and sell all their goods. Get away with it. The, the problem I get to is that to get to court and not just say, wolves did it, <laughs> rather than yes. going, I did I'm it, but I am a wolf. Well, you panic. one of those things that you start off, yeah, you start off slow, and then you slowly begin to believe. Yeah. That, so you, you start off in that sort of, yeah, people I was escort, escorting through the hills and quite legitimately were attacked by wolves one evening mm. um, and this dreadful thing happened and then over the ne- the course of the next 10 or so murders mm. he starts to sort of take on this 
crazy wolf persona type yeah. thing before then he actually yeah believes it himself his, yeah what initially started off as a, a way i can get away with this is now actually his own truth which yeah. Is, uh, uh, uh. yeah isn't it i mean he could have seen the bodies and then just convinced himself at the stake going did i do this and that's mm. all it takes the seed of doubt going oh my god i'm a wolf if he has blackouts or anything <laughs> just i still can't mm. get over the backstory you gave to the other wolves <laughs> i mean that i mean that is impressive i mean <laughs> he just genuinely believed they were wolves and they they were from valencia it was like, dude, just say you're a werewolf. You don't need to have or talked was to it them. Three guys doing the murdering. Were there three of them? Oh, I hadn't thought that. Yeah, they, and they were just three, two other guys that he knew, and they were a murdery team. Um, oh well, what? Oh yeah, and maybe he's know. that damaged that he the, doesn't dob them in. He's or they've convinced yeah. him that they're wolves. Oh, did they turn up with wolves like coats on them? Maybe so. Yeah. And they've been killing people, and then they just put on some fur and went, "Rar, we're wolves. You're Rar. a wolf too. Go on, come on. Oh my God, you're totally a wolf, man. Come on, let's kill these people." Yeah, it could be. Could oh, be. that's chilling. <laughs> <laughs> so two other people got away with it completely, absolutely scot free. Antonio or... and Don Gennaro. Anto- Antonio, and it's Don. bloody Gennaro <laughs> from the the chef. <laughs> God damn it. They're out yeah, there they're somewhere. still out there. They're still out there. <laughs> During this trial, going, I can't believe that worked. <laughs> damn good story. Thank you very much. And what do you think, people? What do you think of making soap out of human fat? Tell us your thoughts, your theories on this one. Let's just do some podcast psychology on this one. Yeah, <laughs> let's all just weigh in. Weigh in with your theories. Let's go extreme on this one in the comments. In the comments of this episode, when we post it on Instagram and on Facebook, on Twitter, wherever you use your social media weigh in with your theories on this was he crazy what do you know about lycanthropy yeah. as a defense i, I do yeah. want more lycanthropy stories because i yeah definitely have to be doing some more of those there um, are a few so out a few there there are a there. few out there it's it's a weird one because it's it's not easily found you have to sort of deep dive yes. into things and i think it's a it's a muddy area but experts people who've read about it are oh, hit us up with those stories um or do you just think he was a bit of a dick there there is that that version of events too um mm-hmm. yeah remember he'd already killed the guy who came looking for money this is true yeah is i true. don't know if he did a wolfy thing on him uh, you never know we'll put some sound effects in to this episode <laughs> <later on. laughs> of just howling at the moon or your favorite oh you know what tag us in your favorite full moon werewolf themed songs go on then. <laughs> how many are there there's quite a few. Are there? You're not seeing American Wealth in London. They crammed a lot in there. <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair enough. No, I've not seen that for quite some time. Oh, should we watch that later? Since I was about 15 or something. <laughs> I think I've shared... I don't know if I've shared on this feed, but on my own Instagram feed, I have the most stunning print... Mm of an artist who's done a print of American Wealth in London. I will probably share it this weekend so you can see it. It is absolutely staggering. This um, incredible print of the slaughtered lamb and the people outside of American Wealth in London. And I stare at it every day going, ha, 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 ha. I love it. Oh, let's all watch that this weekend. <laughs> and if you if you are a fan of the lovely cannibal Nazi tales, then do come and join us on Patreon where we have a whole host of murderous mayhem um, for you to enjoy. <laughs> There's lots of exciting things over there. And if you do like a bourbon. Oh, yes. And if you do like an old-fashioned. Don't forget the old-fashioned. Don't forget the bacon. Mix up an old-fashioned. Get some bacon in, because why not? It's the weekend. You know, get your, get your weekend bacon in, double your order, and make yourself a nice fat wash bourbon, because if you're a serious bourbon fan, it's worth doing. I am really impressed by that. Absolutely. Join us on Patreon. Leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts about The Poisonous Cabinet. Tell us lovely, lovely things and tell your friends about us. Share the love. Share the poisony goodness. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside The Poisonous Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Oh,